Welcome. This is Yubin Chiu, a project consultant of the Preparatory Office for RIPIC, the International Centre for the Interpretation and Presentation of World Heritage Sites. Pleasure to meet you all at the 2021 online lecture series on understanding World Heritage Interpretation and Presentation. Highly appreciate you all for joining today's lecture. The 2021 RIPIC online lecture series has been held since last April. Starting with Professor Mario Santana's lecture, we had a lecture with President Alberto Gallandini and Professor Maria Gregory Burbis. Today, we are going to have a lecture with Dr. Hafizur Rahman. Lectures will be held once a month until this October, and a special discussion will be held in November. The poster you are watching is unloaded on our Facebook page and Instagram too. If you are joining the lecture on YouTube, you can find the link to our Facebook and Instagram on the live streaming video's description. As you may know, what leads World Heritage Interpretation and Presentation into a more communicative, inclusive, and sustainable one is your active cooperation. So, Come and join the lectures and leave your opinions and questions about the lectures and World Heritage issues on the YouTube or Facebook live streaming videos. On the online lecture series, we have time for questions after having the lectures. Now, before we start today's lecture, I would like to introduce our lecturer, Dr. Hafizur Rahman. Dr. Hafizur Rahman is a research fellow at the School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry, MCASI of Curtin University. He has more than 12 years of teaching, research and consultancy experience in the broad areas of cultural heritage and interactive digital media, which includes digital and virtual heritage, heritage conservation, augmented virtual mixed reality, 3D modeling, photogrammetry, interaction design, and user evaluation. Being a founding member of ICOMIS Bangladesh, he provided leadership and direction to the local and international development authorities, museums, and heritage institutes. He collaborated with the UNESCO Chair for Cultural Heritage and Visualization in developing an integrated framework for research, training, documentation and dissemination of digital and virtual heritage and 3D assets. He has a PhD degree in digital heritage interpretation from the National University of Singapore, and he has received four international awards, published 34 research papers, and won 18 research projects. Now, let's start today's lecture. A great pleasure to meet you, Professor. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone who is watching these videos and these lecture series from different parts of the world. Let me thank you, the International Center for Interpretation and Presentation of All Heritage, <coughs> and giving me the, uh, this, this magnificent and honorable opportunity to present today. Uh, particularly, i like to thank Sovin Chu and uh, Namukin uh, and rest of the teams who is working behind the scene and uh, make it these things happening. Uh, I feel honored to be part of this important group of experts presenting their experiences and works in the critical issues of interpretation and presentation of wall heritage sites and properties. Equally, I am proud to follow the leadership and wisdom of their speakers, of these speakers, uh, of this. Uh, 2021 online lecture series. I hope uh, you will enjoy today's presentation. Uh, for my presentations, uh, I may take a little bit of uh, the expected time, but hopefully you will enjoy it. And then I will try to make uh, remain uh, very general because uh, I want to reach most of the general audience of today's. So let's start. So today the title uh, is Haters Interpretation, Digital Media and End Users. Although um, this is a generic title, 
I will focus mostly on the three part. Basically, I will try to focus on digital heritage interpretation. Uh, this is my field of uh, interest. And I, I talk about the PhD research I did uh, on this digital heritage interpretation. <coughs> Sorry. I will try to some highlight some highlights and challenges for which I've worked for the last three and a half years and uh, some promises and prototypes the, uh, that we have been developing and working uh, for the betterment of the interpretation strategies and uh, promote tourism. So uh, let's talk about digital heritage interpretation. Uh, maybe uh, you know about how, about digital heritage. If you search in the Google, you will get thousands of entries of digital heritage. There are uh, websites, so there are companies, uh, there are uh, books, and there are different way of uh, defining digital heritage. But uh, this is we, but we can say this is a public word or buzzword. Let's focus on what is digital heritage through the definition of UNESCO. So according to UNESCO, any unique resources constituting cultural values of human knowledge and expression created or converted into digital form. So it can be born digital, it can be digital surrogate or digital twin. So you go to a certain uh, heritage place, you took a photographs, you upload the photographs, digital photographs, it's become part of the digital heritage because it's linked to the cultural value of some certain places. So it can be 2D and 3D. So let's talk about the what is interpretation or how it is interpretation according to the oxford learners dictionary so uh, it says that uh, interpretation as the particular way in which it is understood or explained so when you go to hate side either we we see the interpretation board we try to understand by ourselves uh, this is some sort of self interpretation self understanding rather than a reflexive phenomena other way is other options is like uh, the definition uh, is, is explained when you go some, we, we have a guide or tour guide or interpreter that help us to understand the site uh, through their presentation and communications, the, through the stories, it's more like an act of an interpreter. So, so it's telling the story. This In general, heritage interpretation means the storylines that are adopted to the help the visitors to engage with and understand the place or object that they are looking at. So what happened when you use digital media or digital tools? For example, when you use a mobile app or a 360 degree panorama in a large screen or head mounted display, the, uh, the digital media, the digital content uh, become an interpreter. So in this situation, the installation become the interpreter and the visitors and end users just have in the other side end users we watch, we try to interpret the content. And therefore the act of this media or the tools can be referred as an act of interpretation. So when this is act of interpretation, there comes the point of how to plan, how to design the digital contents, how we should design the interactions so that the user, end users get the better or the best way of understanding the past, how we communicate the end users. So that is the focus of my, uh, uh, my research. So there are different projects are going on. Uh, there are different labs working on uh, digital heritage and virtual heritage and uh, conferences are happening uh, reconstructions and different sorts of uh, digital media to making uh, the better way of uh, scholarship but still there are some gaps uh, for example in most cases we see that this is the descriptive rather than interpretive way of this is a one-way transfer or podcast rather than an exchange, assuming everyone understands the same thing in a similar fashion. But it is not true. It's, it's, it's the same legacy happens for the digital, uh, for the physical heritage, because understanding depends of individual spatial literacy, subjectivity, cultural positioning. And, you know, that's how its subjective interpretation happens. So digital heritage is not outside of that. When you present something, this understanding cannot be, you know, the understanding cannot be the same to the all audience. <clears throat> Second, we see that there is a 
uh, fascinations among us with the, with the new technology, largely motivated towards achieving visual fidelity and photorealistic representations. And, um, and sometimes we are so fascinated with the technology, we, we maybe not know the myriad know-how about the uh, about the uh, what is the intangible value behind this and how we present those intangible values uh, uh, to convert it to the digital media and the missing the potentials of uh, collective cultural memories and <clears throat> there is always a emic and ethic view of, of, of a heritage sites and there is an insider understanding and outsider and there might be universal value of outsiders from the perspective but there might be something interested and very very interesting stories and uh, myths of the cultural that represent some sort of cultural uh, values of that site. So there are also lack of literacy. Yes, this trend are ch trends are changing. Uh, there are new theories and understanding is coming, but still there is a uh, um, lit lack of literacy focus on the theory and methods of digital heritage interpretation, digital heritage and this interpretation. <clears throat> Well, uh, while we see charters available for interpretation and presentation, specifically interpretation presentation for cultural heritage sites, but does we have something similar for digital heritage? I don't think so, uh, from my current knowledge. So motivated, sorry, mo mo motivated by widespread popularity and driven by the risk of losing uh, the valuable data UNESCO 2003 has adopted charters for preservation of, uh, of the heritage assets, but uh, uh, indication how we can preserve the heritage assets and how the training can be happened, but really consider the interpretations of and presentation of heritage. Uh, London, there is, yes, yes, there is London charters and principles of cells. Uh, but whereas the former focuses primarily on the computer visualization methods and their implications only. The latter is actually the detailed workout of how to improve the conditions and applicability of the London charters. And there are some recommendations and uh, uh, ethics principles as well, but we do not see very definite or detailed guidelines for how we, when we want to make a digital installations or even app or website, what are the considerations we should do and take and how we develop these kind of things from a developer perspective. So let's talk about heritage interpretations. So uh, free because uh, in heritage management, this is a well, you know, uh, well researched domain, well practiced domain. They have definitions, and Freeman Titan considered as the father of the heritage interpretations. And his seminal book, Interpreting Our Heritage, he mentioned interpretation is an educational activity which aims to reveal meanings and relationships through the issue of original objects by first hand experience and by interactive media rather than simply to communicate factual information. So he talked about. Uh, giving a holistic understanding of the past to the audience through interpretive interpretations. So if we see there are uh, different methods and theories about heritage interpretation, because basically they are focused on the two uh, uh, two categories. One is information flow, another is information presentation. So FIS model of interpretation says that uh, every information should be followed from the first level, that is heritage professionals, to the next level, to the, that is uh, popular interpretation. So, the uh, so popular interpretation do not, I think general people do not have access, cannot get the actually the information from the first time experience kind of thing. So, is always the information filtered to the next level. And Ujil's model says about how to present, that is recreation and reconstruction. Recreation is a partly present, which is basically for the amusement park kind of this uh scenarios and reconstruction is presenting the past in a uh, holistic way but it's really difficult and if we see the titans have a uh, lot of sorry titans have six principles that is mentioned to how to better presentation of interpretation of heritage sites in a physical heritage uh, site uh, we need to uh, he talked about the relate of personal experience revelation teachables provocations present the whole and a separate program need for everyone because do not everyone do not see the same thing in the same way but uh there are other scholars who actually elaborate titan's principles and they also offer uh five more principles if we sync their uh, uh principles so they talked about the encourage to discover consumer leads synthetic to the local people sympathetic sorry to the local people freedom of control and different kind of themes or thematic presentations 
So, and if we see, uh, there are actually four objectives that, uh, that we need to consider for a interpretive activities, uh, even if it's accessible uh, for digital headers interpretation. Uh, first of all, we need to satisfy the end users. Second, we need to provoke them some sort of getting them some sort of in, in increase some awareness to protecting the actual or uh, the original cultural heritage sites or the cultural activities and third to learning uh convey some symbolic meaning or cultural meaning to the end users so uh, uh that is some sort of learning activity should be included in the interpretive process and finally this is a multiple perspective of the past so we never know what happened in the past we cannot guarantee this is we are 100% correct what happened. So interpretive process should present the past from a multiple perspective, and thus it provides the opportunity to have a broader and alternative understanding of the past. So there comes the point uh, of dialogic and interactions. So dialogue and interactions is often been uh, started by different authors and scholars in these days, but Yes, it is dialogue interaction means to develop a collective knowledge base. We can use the dialogue interactions to in this if we can in the digital media and digital head is so we can engage expert to expert, expert to public and public to public interactions and dialogues. We can have actually collective uh, knowledge, collective narratives, and that can help to give a better understanding of different perspective of the same head sites. So here comes a conceptual model. So we need a, uh, effective presentations, some sort of cultural learning, and an embody embodiment because we need to embody it. Our embodied interaction needs to be happen when we interact with the digital media. And all these three things need to be in a environment that dialogue and interaction can happen. So I come to this uh, framework that here we see the uh, the ultimate objectives we need to satisfy provocate learning and multiple perspective of the past that is if we see that is depending dependent variables and we have independent variables we need the presentations embodiment cultural learning and dialogue interactions and i uh, from learning from the uh, uh, hci uh, in um, human behavior studies so i and uh, computer games we can develop like a 15 guidelines, I developed 15 guidelines here, uh, how to reach these aspects, how to reach presentation, how to reach embodied interaction, cultural learning and dialogue interactions. And if we can achieve those four aspects, it eventually will impact theoretically uh, on the participant and it, it will consequence in their cognitive states and in the end of the day, it, they will get better interpretations. So I tested the models in a world hate sites in Bangladesh. This is Shampur Mahabharata Muddhis Monastery. Uh, it is situated, uh, developed, established or developed some 33rd century AD. Uh, this is the World Cultural Heritage Site uh, recognized by UNESCO in 1985. Uh, probably it is the second largest Buddhist monastery after Nalanda, India. So it is, you see that there are cells around the periphery. This is for the students coming from different parts of the world. And this is the center of the temple slash their study uh, cells. So, uh, so converting those 15 considerations, I developed a uh, online platform that accommodates both professional views and public contributions. And there are different uh, features inside that they can upload photos, uh, 3D models, blogs, uh, and they have forums to discuss with each other. They can communicate with the video chat and they can contribute in the video. They can have the virtual tours uh, and linked with external sites uh, they can upload public uh, files latest news and feedback and obviously it should be connected with this social media like facebook and there are two different treatments i have developed for the two different groups uh, validated by a pilot study with expert and a questionnaire survey for the two different groups to test how they learn from this uh, enjoying this um, uh, platform so there are professional content developed by the professionals and their public contents comes when it has been between the two uh, experiment. It was open for public to contribute. And uh, the second group actually get the both professional content and public content and interact with this site, online website for one week, both of them. And then end of the day, we, we try to measure their understanding 
uh, through these questionnaires, and it has a uh, both qualitative and quantitative uh, survey. And all the survey data uh, is available through uh, these publications. So definitely, the second group get a better understanding, better interpretation of the hate sites. And uh, I don't want to longer uh, this uh, because uh, we have limited time. Mm. So uh, you can always access to these uh, publications and see the data sets. But anyway, oh, oh, the, the, what I learned from this experiment that I want to share, that to make the end user satisfied of a virtual visit, 3D immersive digital media or very interactive things may not be the only choice. Even a 2D environment can be a fun, engaging, if proper interpretive method is applied. And second, dialogic interaction in the interpretive process can work as a facilitator, uh, where the validation and screening of inf information are done through participatory basis. So this is a very important thing. And, uh, and contribution apparently may seem irrelevant or unnecessary from the general people. However, each piece of information may work as a gems and can help to build the bigger scenarios. Uh, the, to ensure adequate participation from the non-organic group uh, or group with a pre-selected participant is uh, it is required as you know boost up it requires encouragement to because because he, people feel shy to to contribute to shy to get in, involved but once they involve they, the things happen they start happening they start unfolding uh, uh commenting uh, making new friends uh, giving more informations and new things are coming uh, happening so they tell the story to the others and other joints so juxtaposition from public and professional content side by side the research shows that interpretation can be an open-ended process and uh, there are more than one way of interpreting the past that's very very true incorporating multiple voices side by side and allowing dialogue among the end users it opened up the possibilities of enhanced interpretations and legitimacy in understanding the past so we should think about uh not finding the truth but the truthfulness and get people involved is is the key success of an interpretive process so we uh, come to the next point to uh, talk about the talk about the um, highlights the uh, challenges uh, but uh, uh, this is I, I talk about the, um, my three and a half years work with the UNESCO research and one of the point is I uh, we feel like a very uh, difficult to deal with, that is the 3D models in virtual is, and is loss of 3D models in virtual heritage. So uh, I worked for the three and a half years for this uh, Professor Eric Champion, uh, UNESCO Chair for the Culture Heritage and Visualizations in developing an integrated framework for research, training, documentation, and dissemination of uh, digital virtual heritage and 3D assets. So 3D assets is the key of, of this kind of um, uh, uh, of, of this project, but what we found, uh, we are losing 3D asset in in many ways. Uh, okay, I will talk about this, but before going to the next next uh, next slide, I better to uh, discuss about what we some general terms that would be. I, I believe that will be help to the our general audience today. Uh, so when we uh, talk about uh, the because virtual reality and augmented reality is is, is also uh, people um, perceive this thing in a different way but uh, milgram and kishino uh, first uh, proposed a reality virtuality continuum so what we see uh, in our real world real environment that is completely unmodeled is, is the real world real environment and virtual environment on the other side what is designed or developed completely through the computer. And this is completely modeled world. For example, we use Assassin's Creed or Tomb Raider, the games. This is completely, uh, we navigate through it. It, it is completely you know, with full degree of freedom. It's, it's a virtual world. So in between anything is, is a mixed reality. So mixed reality, uh, a part of the real world and part of the virtual world, is how we blend these things is, it can be termed in different way. 
So for example, if you were in a virtual world and we can see partial of our real world, for example, you see our hand, we move one object from one place to another, is is uh, from according to the Milgram and Casino is, is a augmented virtuality. And when we are using our uh, a mobile device or other sort of uh, controls that can project a 3D model in the real world, and if we can, according to the definition, it is augmented reality. So uh, for enjoying or viewing any kind of virtual reality or augmented reality, we need device. And for virtual reality, especially, we need head mounted display. Uh, for phone based, we can, there are three types basically. Uh, like a phone based virtual reality, uh, we, we use the phone, we use in a case, and we use in, the, in our head, head gears. So, and it comes sometimes comes with a, a controller. So this is the most easiest way to access uh, convenient and economic to get uh, virtual, uh, to access the virtual reality. Uh, the second one is like we can have a seated or a standing virtual reality is sometimes comes with cable, sometimes not. And, and it can sometimes it track the eyeball and uh, get a more uh, interesting interactive way of uh, present of uh, virtual reality world. And there are other ways of um, like walkable virtual reality that comes with, uh, that is see-through. So we can have a mixed reality environment, uh, see-through environment through this head my hand gear. So we can see, we can uh, move around uh, our spaces and we can interact with uh, both real world and virtual world at the same time, but uh, before, uh, that not be possible with other classes that obscure your real world from the uh, surroundings. So the, come back to the point. So in our project, we the basic major issues we dealt with uh, that the missing of the 3D models. I know uh, the audience, because it's not possible to uh, ask you questions, do you have a 3D model? Uh, I can get the answers, but I know you have 3D models but it may be stored in your personal hard drive or in your some archival places or somewhere. But I do not have access. Anyone can, do not have access to it. And then it's, it's for what? And then, you know, it's not, when we have a 3D model, we have researched the 3D model, we developed a 3D model, and end of the day is, is it not accessible? So that is the tragedy. That is the tragedy that we were losing uh to contribute in the digital humanities and not only in the personal level we see it's happening in the these challenges is also of accessing or preservation of haters games 3d assets and environment million dollar projects has been spent to making like virtual forbidden city of rome reborn with the new technologies or the new showcasing the new scholarship but uh within times within times they are lost they become a very uh, famous exemplars of lost, hidden, or obsolete digital heritage. Uh, it has been said, it has been mentioned that only a web page lasts for 100 days. Professor Eric was writing a book in 2011 with playing with the past. So half of his example disappeared within three years when he was writing the book. So it's very you know, concerning. So we also tried to understand what happened with the uh, scholarly publications. Uh, we, digital heritage models are seldom we see outside the conference presentations or one of museum exhibitions or digital reconstruction used for films and television. So why, why are they are gone? Uh, so we attempt to record accessible 3D models and their 3D assets from the proceedings of the last three consecutive publications of major digital heritage events and conferences which is 2019 and, and, and earlier. And we actually, from 14 proceedings, 1,483 papers we sorted, and we only found nine uh, that really contain the explicit links to 3D models. It's still, we can access the 3D models uh, to only this thing. So they are gone. The rest of the publications which has been used in 3D model, they might be somewhere stored, but we cannot access them anymore. So uh, what are the causes? So first of all, there is no, we couldn't find a very foolproof way of preserve 3D assets. There are public institutions or 3D repositories. 
uh, they really help you to download 3D models what they have but not upload. Uh, difficult to find models as they are not typically connected with external sites and uh, portals. There are more than 50 private commercial repositories. Most of the for they are trading and are not intended to for preservations. We often we often uh, have a data provenance and metadata. They are lack of data provenance and metadata, but offers consistent file format and protocols. 3D models are easy to find and get and download if you want to buy. But uh, yes, there is no way that we can use those platforms for preservations. Uh, secondly, there is an insufficient understanding of shared understand insufficient shared understanding of how to best develop integrate and demonstrate the research values of 3D heritage models. So virtual heritage is not simply the recreation or reconstruction of the past. Significance cannot be replaced by you know the photorealism or photorealist things. Uh, associated values must be conveyed for deeper understanding of the interpretation that we believe. And for deeper understanding of the cultural values behind, hence we also need not only the metadata but also the metadata. And finally, uh, digital heritage scholarly articles are typically published and uh, distributed in the PDF format while they are relatively secure, but we have seen that there is a little interactivity, integration, and immersivity. Uh, some of the uh, publishers allow to upload 3D contents. They have their own viewers. Sometimes they use a uh, sketchfair for viewing. But these models are typically not dynamically linked with any kind of scholarly information such as metadata or metadata. So, uh, so our next step to we we move to this project to engage and educate uh, general people to make three D models or three D assets. So we um, with uh, with people who have uh, less access to the budget and less access to resources. So we usually use free and open source software for photogrammetry or image-based modeling. So we, we comprehensively studied performance configurations of this of these free tools, and we developed workflow how to make the three D models from images, and not only the three D models but how we can share the three D models online. We can print the three D models online, and dedicated workflow for making the three D models to the ARVR kind of uh installation and development so we developed uh, online teaching learning materials which is freely accessible uh and one hour course to learn the basic of, of photogrammetry images modeling using free and open source softwares using various free tools uh, and uh, contents and youtube videos for uh, making 3d models uh not only making 3d models what are the uh, repositories and 3d model viewers available in the market uh, from the institutionals and uh, the commercial uh, repositories and what are the feature list. So anyone can develop the 3D models and they want to showcase and to upload, they can uh, find this data set useful. And you can actually share this, uh, sorry, uh, access this survey to of 3D digital heritage repositories and platforms accessible to uh, a virtual archaeology review. So we have conducted several workshops, public workshops, to uh, to to access people and to make people to know more about 3D models and development of ARVR kind of uh, uh, for for haters. And Professor Eric uh, dedicatedly worked several workshops for game making and game development and uh, engaged people in in, in cultural haters games. So there are some of the uh, examples of uh, some some of our works, we made posters for publications and, and general distribution. So we, I come to the third part of the presentation. So we talk about the problems and issues. Now we'll talk about some kind of promises and, and, and some of the experiment, little experiment that I have done through myself or with my students. So we think that there is like a new three promising trends is uh, there. It is first of all, this uh, virtual reality or mixed reality is moving towards a consumer uh, component-based systems. 
there are new uh, tools and technologies are coming uh, which is become more cheaper and more accessible to the general people a smartphone is a stereoscopic viewer a sensor and a pc is evolving every day uh, for example samsung gear gear and new sensors new kind of uh, apps are coming uh, to make it you know uh, more accessible to air vr kind of uh, experience consumer technology frameworks is coming and is helping to improve the access uh, people don't like to uh, download a large apps but this kind of technology web based like air vr uh, things like uh, you know, tools for web xr or open xr can do not need user to download any things but they can use the browser to access uh, the, their the air experiences make reality experiences here uh, dr stewart was showing how gps based olfactory uh, smell reality so it blows sense to you as you walk over a field uh, there are apps like dead man's eyes our uh, artifact kit uh, use augmented reality with archaeological practice uh, this system built with like a smartphone and Arduino microcontroller and Unity applications uh, that while you are in on site you can see the real things and you can watch augmented object as well as sounds and smells of the past directly in, in, in to the present. So it gives you a better understanding or you know or more immersion uh, to to that field. And new HMDs are coming with uh, new uh sensors and uh and these all factories ipad and iphone recently added their alida sensor so it can help you to develop the 3d scan very fast but not only scanning uh digital making digital content but it also helps the depth sensor so better placement better interactions of augmented reality object in and around uh the audience who it will it will help it is helping and it will help probably in a more better way in coming days we will see different uh, apps are coming uh recently we is a very prominent and fem, uh, app recently been introduced uh in south korea uh sk telecom google and cultural Heritage administration developed this app uh is is 5g technology with google uh cloud service and air enhanced cultural locations so anyone visit this uh, Changdeok place can use this app and on an arrival the visitors can be guided around the palace and around the site through a virtual avatar or creature named Heichi and uh, walking around the different locations they will uh, explore different uh, characters and they can meet the uh, the kings and the queens and most importantly <laughs> they can actually take selfies from there with them so this technology is evolving and this will be this is the very initial examples of this 5g technology with uh, air core and uh unity game engine and google's cloud and course location based and course and hope and uh this will you know mimic and uh, follow suit the other places as well i believe very shortly this is very high end high end technology has been used but on the other side this is a very simple gps technology uh, has been used by professor uh, dr banaditi uh, dravas in uh, newcastle university of uh, new south wales australia she with her student developed a very simple app and the gps app that uh, for the visitors to enhance the uh, tourist of that certain locations of Newcastle. So whenever you visit some places, it popped up with some sort of informations. And when you click, it might be a text, a video, an audio, and it can be embedded in the locations. And you do not need to high-end uh, 5G network. And even if you're offline, if you have phone has a GPS tracker, it can track uh, those location and those point. And the most interesting thing is like, uh, she's trying to get the community input and uh, the community stories embed through this app. So it is a, it will evolve, it will grow uh, every day uh, when the community get more involved, they put their story and their image, uh, different kind of information inside the app. Hopefully uh, this is a very uh, interesting example uh, will happen and it will uh, be very popular soon. 
<clears throat> we know the recent uh, of the pandemic and professor alberto also mentioned that uh, we are suffering so the museums so 90% of the world museums uh, when it is uh, are closed during the pandemic and it is believed that one of eight may never be open so we come we meet me with uh, professor ai champion with two other uh, assistants we developed a uh, vr museum a template that uh, for the local museums any museum uh, authority can use that template put the 3d models and make some interactions inside it so uh, we use uh, developed for oculus quest and uh, there is some interactions some games inside so some interactivity um, and uh, interactivity so the audience uh, can learn and uh, with their interactivity the map changed and they can go and to one room to another and virtually visit the locations of the artifacts where it is Uh, one of my students, he's, because in a virtual world, we do not need to be confined by the boundaries. And we are, if you're not mimicking a real world museum, it is very interest, easy or, or very, it's very interesting to develop a museum that is open-ended. So he made a very interesting project. This is a, he ran a script. So whenever you run a script to set, uh, it, it generate a new spaces, new place, new extension of the museum and automatically place the new 3D models in the museum and with baked images on baked lighting. So um, during the pandemic, there are three groups actually suffered. Uh, first of all, the guide, the tour guide, the museums and the visitors. They cannot visit the site. The uh, tour guide become you know, uh, jobless and the museum shut down. And so to make these three groups uh, help each other, I was trying to develop a 360 panoramic live virtual tours. So I developed a workflow uh, with a simple 360 camera with a mobile phone. Here we see the uh, tour guide is telling the story of the lost generations in a cartoon museum gallery. And the other side, uh, in a few kilometers away, some school kids at seventh grade, they are watching this live virtual 360 tour with the head mounted gears and they can at the same time seem seamlessly can contact the tour guide to about any questions and query and it is very interesting uh, to see and the engagement of the audience so this is the classroom settings where a uh, few of them are wearing the 3d uh, head mounted gears and the others are watching in the large screen and they can directly communicate with each other uh, in the virtual environment and this is the screenshot of what they see through the uh, through the goggles, they can also see who are present in the in the virtual environment as well. They can also talk to each other, chat each other, uh, and make a collaborative visit or, or to the real time with the guide and also the other visitors. So uh, consumer graded 360 cameras become cheaper. So uh, if you do not have make a live virtual tour, it is also possible to make 360 panoramic virtual tour connect each bubble together and make some interactivity inside. And a series of bubbles can give an impression of virtually visit and tour in a track. And we can also embed um, text, image, videos, and 3D model inside these uh, bubbles. And it is fun and it is free to uh, use and and embed this with the Google Street View. One of my students, uh, she took the 360 degree things to the next level. She went to the aviation museum, took 360 photos, and then she made a game with these 360 photos and that can be accessed through any, any Android and uh, iOS, uh, um, iOS device. And we see 360 degree uh, panoramas. She used um, uh, interactive elements. So for the kids, so uh, for tapping, from moving while moving from one panorama to another, one space to another space, they they can see some highlighted uh, planes, aeroplanes, engines, and and many artifacts. So the tap, they make uh, some answers and they get badges and go to the next level. So it is a fun for the kids and with a very simple uh, 3 city panoramas with Unity game engine. 
One of my the PhD students have been developing a collaborative mixed reality project using two Microsoft HoloLens. This is the walkable mixed reality maps with interactive objects and 3D models that appears only when the participants near to each other, they talk to each other, they do something like a games. So the ship moves from one point to another from Europe to Australia, like Batavia. And uh, the map data, the geodescent format is handled the time related data. Uh, alternative historical interpretation can be viewed and interacted with and the results shared when they uh, communicate each other. So we did another uh, experiment with the collab collaborative, uh, you know, uh, collaboration, how collaboration works in a game environment to move one character. So here there is two people uh, with uh, simple sensors with the head mounted gears, the time to, you know, uh, move one character in a game and when they communicate to each other to for this movement, we try to understand how the collaboration impact their learning of the uh, in a game environment. So augmented reality, uh, there are many ways to use the augmented reality technologies for telling stories and it can be used, uh, especially for the kids, uh, when we can capture the real real color and put it in the 3D models and animation and they could be, you know, they, we can involve and their engagement can be enhanced and uh, museums, yes, they are using, but still, uh, and we can use the uh, text, not only the text, audio and video in many ways to, to tell the story uh, with simple tricks. Augmented reality can also help uh, to give some kind of teleportal of virtual visit of heritage sites. And this is very fun to make such a kind of things. Like in the diagram, we see if we can place a virtual door and we are in a living room and the other side can be open to any kind of virtual world. We need a 360 panorama or a 360 video or a 3D environment uh, in the other side. So in this way, we can actually place a door in our uh, living room and we can pass through the door with the phone and we can see like the other side. For example, here is the Hobbit uh, village. And when you inside the Hobbit village, you can see the other side of the door is the, is the living room. So one of my students, uh, he make it to the very interesting project. She, he went to different parts of the path and took 360 photos of the street arts. And these photos he make uh, two, two scenarios. One is a, uh, a room uh, that he embedded all the uh, street arts to his wall and place a door, but uh, gateway in the campus. So anyone with this app uh, can go through this uh, door and see the all this uh, wall paint in a virtual uh, world. Very interesting. Also, he made uh, 360 degree bubbles. So with this app, you can place this 360 bubble in the backyard, and you can move uh, from 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 with this phone camera to one point to another and see the, three, the paintings in a 360-degree panorama. Uh, like recreating a historical event in a mixed reality environment is a fun. Uh, this can help to tell the story and give a real feelings of being, being in a certain historic event. Like this is a epic speech of uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the first president of Bangladesh, uh, in the 7th March, uh, 1971 has been included in the memory of the World International Register, uh, a list of world important documentary heritage maintained by UNESCO. So I was worked on this and I developed a workflow to recreating uh, his speech in a mixed reality environment. And I visualized, uh, it can be visualized in a macro HoloLens. So, so when we have a 3D model, it's animation, you can put in the uh, real world and you can see how it looks in a, uh, mixed reality environment, for example, here. Sorry. So you see the animated video and it looks like a, uh, he is giving the lectures in front of you. So you can move around. You can uh, see the speech in the real world. It's uh, the character is giving the experience with this spatial surround sound.
uh, we, we, we are about, about this uh, project of potential of AI and data mining archives. And this is a uh, fabulous step that uh, this use the technology of deep knowledge and historical reconstructions. So Venice, uh, this is now the project is on the second phase. So they are uh, developing a Venice mirror world is a 4D model with this deep learning technology and very uh, intensive uh, 4D models of historical reconstructions in the decades. So this AI and new technology is coming and we will see it will happening to virtual reconstructions and interpretations uh, in later dates. And also uh, this is a, that was, that example was a uh, very high long I mean very big budgeted project with a lot of people sir, researchers are involved in this in that project but uh, still there are like a free uh, pretend models is available uh, for use uh, for example like uh, Google has released their uh, TensorFlow pretend models for the mobile nets and we can still uh, retain the model and use in the Google Unity uh, to to develop and uh, some sort of app to that can be uh, identify objects and um, make some interactivity according what you want. For example, I use this uh, Google TensorFlow models to talk about argumented haters. So here uh, I trained that model to identify 10 local flowers and uh, tell their local names in a local language and local voice has been recorded with the local people and then whenever this app see this uh, object uh, here it is the flower so you see uh, the skins that it can tell what it is in a local language so google has recently developed the olaru app with the ai with the, with the enormous technology it can snap a photo of an object and Ularu use this machine learning to translate it into uh, and then the 10 endangered language and it, it, they open it for the public so people can go inside and uh, you know rename and edit in their own, own language. So I can keep talking but there are many new uh, technologies coming, new thing is happening and um, but what I want to say that uh, uh technology is always for uh for for physical preservation physical uh conservations of the heritage uh, it should not uh, supersede uh these obje these objectives so i like this uh, this this uh, this uh, statement from jenna thompson uh she's a professor of philosophy in lot of university she said, computer simulations, however, is good. Contain only what photography, laser technology, and pre existing expertise put into them. But obviously, a real experience that connect us to the deeds of the past people <clears throat> and place us in context where the history was made. And what about the technology, VR, AR, MR? Here is, she says, the VR will never be a substitute for encounters with the real things. So we need to consider this and we need to, uh, whatever we, we, we do we, for the interpretation and presentation on the side of the HTS side with the ins of digital media, we actually uh, need to the original things. You need to uh, preserve or conserve the original what it is there. And thank you for listening to these presentations, but don't forget Whatever we do, whatever we make the 3D contents, we, any installations, app, website, or uh, any kind of virtual world, we need to think about, we need to satisfy, if it is for the, for the audience, we need to satisfy them. We need to somehow provoke them for the conservation and preservation of the original sites or cultural heritage. And there should be some cultural learnings and we will try definitely uh giving them a multiple perspective of the past because my perspective is limited my understanding is obviously limited thank you thank you everyone everyone for for listening uh this today's talk. thank you professor really appreciate for your insightful lecture sure. on digital heritage interpretation and 
uh, especially on your lecture, you uh, shared the uh, shared uh, what her digital heritage interpretation is and what are the challenges it is ex it is facing these days and what are the latest trends uh, with the examples of it. And regarding that one, we have a question. Uh, to you, and uh, well, of course, today our public participants really left lots of questions, and I will read the first question regard regarding that uh, one. And the first question was, uh, well, first of all, greetings from Myanmar. Thank you for joining t uh, today's lecture. Well, could you please share any publications of this digital platform application? Regarding the heritage conservation pr principles, how would you incorporate in this digital platform? Yeah, that was the question. Oh, fantastic. Yes, uh, all my publications uh, are available in academia or if you um, uh, want to uh, have access, they do not have access, uh, please feel free to send me an email. I'll try to send you the copy at least uh, which if there is no embargo by the publishers, I can send you the uh, pre-release version of that. Uh, regarding heritage conservation principles, how would you incorporate in the digital uh, platform? Uh, well, we, we uh, Professor Mario, uh, in the first lectures, he is he's giving a very insightful comment. He said. Uh, not on, on, on all country practice participatory and democracy there are autocracy <clears throat> even even sometimes you you want you cannot conserve or preserve the things because the situation is somewhere some diff uh, difficult but what we do from our interpretive approach if we can engage people we can we can convey the symbolic meanings to the people and they will be they will come up and they will they will understand the value uh, of, of conservation and preservations. And, and that is the beauty of digital media. Uh, I give you a very small, a tiny examples how to uh, incorporate the digital platform. Okay. For example, you see, this is a pencil. This is a pencil, you see. Uh, if I say this is a pencil, it, it, it cost me 30 cent, just 30 cent. But it doesn't make any value to you or me. Is 30 cent pencil but if i tell you the story that it it was used by my granddad my grandfather who died in world war ii then it passed to me my father and who was a liberation warrior uh, in 1971 and he died and this this is this passed to me and this is this has a family family heritage and and i always keep this uh, to my family so when I tell you the story and the behind the scene and what is the importance, then it's not anymore a 30 cent pencil. It becomes invaluable. So that's how we use the digital media, digital platform to tell the story to the audience. And it's a different perspective. So the audience can provoke that they get some sort of empathy to, to, to conserve the uh, real world things. So I hope uh, that is the only way I can think about right now. Great. Great. Thank you for your answer. And well, well, uh, your example about the pencil and the uh, significance of a story on heritage uh, really tells us that uh, tells us about the significance of storytelling, right? Well, yeah, I totally agree that storytelling is really important, especially on the value of heritage. And well, now I will second. Uh, I will share our second question. The second question was, uh, thank you for the eye-opening topic. I would like to know whether any such interactive media is available to the public in Paharpur Monastery in Bangladesh? Yep, that was the question. Several projects uh, that concern with the Paharpur Monastery that digitize the uh, plex, the terracotta plex, which is very valuable, and the digitized. And I don't know where these three models are, why they are there, but uh, I am not aware about there is any kind of interactive media. But I definitely show there was a project that 
made 3D scans of all these terracotta plaques and it was uh, somehow um, you can consult with the Bangladeshi Ecomos and the relative uh, people who were involved in this project and they digitized all this all this terracotta more terracotta. So at least you will get some 3D assets from the monastery. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. Thank you for your answer. And uh, now I will read out the next question. The next question was uh, left by, I'm sorry, I can't read the name of it, but the question was left on our Facebook. It was a great pleasure to meet, uh, enjoy this lecture. In Bangladesh, I think the digital preservation concept is totally a new one, and the technology so Call technological support for this idea is really not such a easy matter. But in a situation while we are losing our prestigious heritages, what initiatives can be taken to exercise this platform, digital heritage preservation in Bangladesh? Well, today uh, a lot of people from Bangladesh and Myanmar uh, are joining today's lecture. So, uh, yeah, I think this question is from Bangladesh. Uh, I really appreciate your concern. I really appreciate people are viewing from Bangladesh and Myanmar. Um, uh, I really appreciate that you, you are concerned about digital preservations. Well, uh, and yes, there is always a spectrum, you know, you, you can have a laser scanner, which is, which is uh, very expensive. Even I don't have an access to, uh, to the laser scanners, but you can always have your mobile phone with you. And it's, it's even if it's a simple mobile phone, what you can do with is the free apps, or you can use tech photos, and there are free apps, uh, plenty of free free apps that I I like. Rigor 3D, there are Meshroom, uh, and free and open source apps. You take photos, you make 3D models through the 3D model uh, through these platforms, and you have blenders that you do not have to pay. You have Mesh Lab that you do not have to pay. And all these three three things can be available, and you can make complete pipelines of making digital twins of any heritage buildings. Well, photogrammetry and even laser scanning is sometimes difficult when there is high foliage, like in Bangladesh. There, you, you cannot find an isolated building. That is one problem. But uh, other than that, uh, this is one way of making digital twins. If you want to at least document history, uh, document the building. You can get access, is, as I mentioned, this is 360 degree for photos, uh, cameras, and it is not that expensive. Even you can have $100, you can get a three, uh, 360 degree cameras, a small cameras that you plug in with your phone and take it to the site and you can just click. It will capture the whole 360 degree images. And within this 360 image, you can, you can come back to your desktop or even through the mobile phone with Google Street View app, you connect these 3D bubbles uh, and then you put it in the Google platform. It is absolutely free and anyone from the Google Street View can jump in and move around the site. That's somehow in the end user level we can contribute. When the government and other bodies are, might do not have uh, such sort of understanding or need to make this th these things, but in the end user levels, we can actually do these things happens. And we you just we just need to you know the intention good intention to make it happen, uh, and do not wait what and how other people will come and act for us. So so there are ways there are ways there is not always uh, need high end technology and um, high end uh, hardware to digital document of a heritage site. Great, thank you for your answer. And well, uh, there is a, just another comment left by the person who left this question. Uh, well, the person's name, or oh, well, I will read it now. Uh, it was uh, Perdusi Simu, and uh, he or she is saying that uh, I was a direct, direct student officer when he was with the uh, WASAS in Kul. Kuma University. Am I reading right? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, thank you for it. And 
Well, it's so good to see that uh, your students are still leaving your que uh, leaving questions on today's lecture. Uh, it's so good to see. And now I will move on to our next question. The next question is, thank you for your lecture. I understand that high technology is one of the crucial aspects of heritage presentation, especially in this situation locking down from the pandemic situation. There has been a movement to develop a metaverse, and I wonder if the metaverse could be helpful for heritage promotion to the public. Uh, 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 actually, I, I, I cannot give you an answer to the point at this point. Uh, at this moment, once in a 2008, uh, 2010, there is a huge hive of uh, Second Life platform. So uh, people are moving to the Second Life, they are opening embassies, they are opening uh, museums and uh, other kind of, uh, and tried to make it popular, but it failed uh, because it takes high-end computer and a high-end bandwidth and somehow it, it never happened. So, Technology comes and technology goes. There are new technologies always coming. Even like, for example, we have 140, more than 140 3D file formats. So which one will you take? Which which format you will save your 3D? So if Metaverse is expect, accepting something in the next day, you, ha you have to make all these 3D models to, their, to, to compatible with that. And it may not be compatible in, in other platform. And uh, I'm not sure, I don't have any uh, direct answer of, of this, but uh, could be, uh, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, your answer. And um, maybe you can keep talk about uh, digital technologies in the future, uh, especially uh, through our Facebook or Instagram, or I mean through our social media channels. We are keep trying to uh, use digital technologies on heritage, on making heritage interpretation and presentation into a more communicative and inclusive one. So I think we can keep share our ideas and opinions uh, on it on our uh, uh, on the internet. Well, uh, as Professor, uh, I mean Dr. Hafizur Rahman mentioned in this lecture. Uh, well, we are all physically uh, parted away in this COVID situation, but we're still connected online. Uh, as you can see, we are uh, all located in different country, like uh, in Australia, in Myanmar or Bangladesh, and in Korea, we are all connected uh, through the online and we can uh, have a lecture and share opinions online. So maybe we can keep talking about it in the future again. Well, I think uh, that is all for today's lecture and Q&A session. And uh, Dr. Hafizur, would you uh, like to say something to our public participants today? Uh, yes, I humbly uh, thank you to all the people about this, uh, uh, to who has organized this International Center for Interpretation and Presentations of our heritage sites, so Min Chu and others behind the scenes who have been working and tracking me for like three, four months to make that happen. And I also appreciate others, uh, participants who have been uh, uh, watching these uh, boring long uh, presentations from me. And uh, I'm sorry for my uh, poor pronunciation sometimes, it, it's broken and uh, sometimes I lost. But I, you feel free to contact me. Anyone feel free to contact me to send any uh, questions or queries, or if you uh, need this kind of uh, uh, my publications or other publications. So I am happy to help, happy to assist. And, and thank you very much. Thank both uh, the technical teams and the audience for, for being here. Well, well, uh, well, thank you for your insightful lecture, actually. Uh, don't tell it, uh, it was a poor presentation, please. <laughs> well, uh, I would like to give 
Uh, I would like to say that uh, we really feel thankful for your insightful lecture, and it was a great honor for us to have you on the online lecture series. Thank you today. And uh, before we t uh, end today's lecture, I would like to give a brief introduction to our next lecture. Well, the next lecture, speaking with a changing world, communicating the heritage of the world with Professor Mike Robinson will be held on 19 August. Further information on the lecture, including the exact time, will be informed on our Facebook page. Please check the Facebook page and the Instagram of the Preparatory Office for further information on the online lecture series. Thanks again for joining us today, and I hope to see you all at the, our next lecture. Goodbye.